Hey. Hi, Luis. Um, well, good morning. Um, welcome to the conference. It's the first day. We're gonna. This talk is called Small Dog Blocks and Closures Origins and Evolution. My name is Juan Escalada. I'm a student at the University of Quilmes. I'm also a software developer at Mercap Software. And, well, we're going to be talking about blocks under closures. We're going to divide this into four parts. On the first part, we're going to analyze a little of where blocks come from and how they came to be what they are today. On the second part, we're going to do a small review of the anatomy of a block, how it's actually represented on a small talk system. We're going to compare if blocks are actually a representation of anonymous functions. You've had some spoilers on the previous talk. And on the last part, we're going to think about the possibilities that this actually gives us on the origin and evolution. We're going to go almost 50 years back to Lisp. Lisp was, an, uh, it was is an expression language. It's consistent. Everything on the language is an expression. And in, on its original implementation, it had dynamic binding and dynamic scoping. This means that any variable that we had was put in a stack of variables, a global stack of variables. So basically, we could redefine the same variable in different scopes and shadow the original value that it had in the more global scope previous to that. So in this little example, we can see what effects it could have. We define a variable x with a value of minus 99 on a global scope. Then we define a function that brings any x variable that it finds. And then in an inner scope with the let command, we define the value of x as 1. If we evaluate get x inside that scope, the value that it brings back is 1 because it's at the top of the stack. And if we evaluate it outside the scope, this variable is popped from the stack, and we get the minus 99 unmodified. This may not seem really complicated, but the truth is that it is a really hard to follow logic. And even in this simple example, it takes some time to see where it's going to take the value of the variable. So you can imagine that in a really big program, if you don't have a really well-documented definition of variables and what they actually mean, it can become quite illegible, Ill unreadable. <laughs> so we fast forward 12 years, and we got Scheme. Scheme is a functional dialect of Lisp created at the MIT by Guy Steele and Jerry Sussman. And it's where it uses, or best introduces, the existence of lexical scoping. The idea of lexical scoping basically means that the values that are bound to a variable of a function are defined by its lexical scope, where it's defined. So we can define a function that has names for variables. And outside the definition of the function, we can access these variables. So we can define the same names in different, in different functions. And they can't be referenced between them. To do this, it was defined the existence of closures. Closures actually represent these bindings between a function or a representation of a function 
and its lexical scope or its definition scope. So here we have a small example written in Scheme. We got a definition of a function that returns an anonymous function bound to one of the parameters. So then we define two functions that evaluate the first one, f, and bound, bind, the va bind the value of x to 5 and 7 uh, accordingly. So we can see here that each of the functions has its own representation of what x actually means. And, well, this is what lexical scoping allows us to have multiple functions defined in maybe even from the same scope as is this lambda defined on f, and they have their own bindings to their variables. So, again, we'll fast forward another 10 years, and we got small dog 80. Small dog 80 is the first free or publicly available version of small dog. It had the idea of local closures, but they were not real closures. They, even so, the, the idea they, of locked and closure is in a small dog even from the 74, not from, from the 80 version. But they had two main problems. They did not allow the re-entrance of the blocks, and they lacked their own local environment. What this means is that one basically could not do recursion on blocks. And we'll see that if we go, this is actually a Squeak 3.9, a version from around 2007. We got define a factorial function that references its same binding to the temporary variable. And when we try to execute it, it brings this, an error to evaluate the block. What is happening here is that, first of all, it cannot re-enter the block because the problem it had was that it tried to execute the original block again inside itself. So this was not allowed, and this was solved easily by copying the original block and trying to execute it. But did, this did not solve the problem because it would execute, but the values would be wrong. The reason is that the bindings that the, the block had were bound directly to the context, and it, not, it did not have a local definition of the variables. So every time, if you try to evaluate this block, having solved the re-entrancy problem, it would just give a collection of ones. So the solution to this was to sh create an array inside the context of the, of the block, inside the block, for say it another way, a temporary array that would bind to the variables and leave the context alone. Okay. So after that was solved, we finally had real closures that worked as they are meant to be in Smalltalk. So now we're going to analyze what is a block and how it's represented. The block, I'll analyze the Farron's quick structure. It's quite similar to VisualWorks. And it's represented by three objects. The compile method, the compile method contains the bytecode of the block and some low-level variables to help the compiler. We got the block closure. The block closure references the bytecode and it's got the knowledge of the context where the block was created. 
and we got the most complex one that is the context. The context has the information of the method that is actually the compile method where the block is defined, the receiver of this of the evaluation and the sender. When we for creating a block, it as it's three objects actually, not just one, it's done in different steps. The first step is the is instantiation of the compile method. When we write the code and we save it in a method or we bound, bound it to a temporary variable on the playground, we instantiate the compiled method. The definition of the block is actually when we bind it to a variable or move it around. So when we are executing the code, but not actually evaluating it. So then the block closure is created. And this block closure is bound to the, uh, to the context of creation of the block. And finally, on the evaluation, we create the outer context that is the one that's sending this, this message. That is not necessarily the same context of uh, creation of the block. It might, it might be if it's evaluated inside the same method where it was created, but as you know, we can pass blocks around as parameters. So a block does mainly three definition, redefinitions of concepts that we use inside small talk normally. First, it redefines self. Self inside a block does not reference the block. It reference the context of creation of the block, actually the instance where it was created. The implicit return, it, it is the return that we're not saying nothing out, simply when the block stops executing or finish evaluating all the expressions inside of it, and it returns to the context of, of evaluation. This means where we are actually evaluating the block, and the explicit return. The explicit return basically tries to return to the outer context of where the block was created. So this means that if we are evaluating it inside a normal method where it was defined, it will exit directly outside of the method. But this can also bring some problems. Because if we pass around a block that has an explicit return, and we try to return, and the original context is already dead, this will fail which means it could be really dangerous if we don't know what we're trying to do with it. So for low level ap application, it's, non it's useful, but on normal, normal development, we shouldn't really use an explicit return, unless it is what we really want to do. So that's it on the anatomy of the lock. Now, this was the original question that brought me to, to research a little about blocks. And it was if blocks are actually the same as an animal function. So I tried to compare some characteristics that an animal function have and see if blocks fulfill them. So I divided into some categories. So high order means that in functions, that a function can be used as a parameter or as a result for other functions. So an anomaly function obviously can be an argument. And so can blocks. We can pass blocks around and evaluate it in different contexts. Can be a result of another function evaluation. 
Yes, it can. We can actually define method or even blocks that returns other blocks, as you've seen with Facundo, that define blocks inside another, and we could partially evaluate them. We got nesting. What nesting means is that you can call or evaluate another function inside of it, even named or named. In this case, we can call methods from inside a block as we can call another blocks inside of it. On the last part, we can see if they have access to non-local variables. Functions can do this because they got closures and blocks too. So the real difference is that anonymous functions allow us to have partial application, which means we can have a function that is defined to receive more than one parameter, one parameter, and if we pass it less than the supposed amounts that they should receive, we receive a function partially applied. Blocks in small dog don't have this char characteristic. So why don't they have it? Well, they're not really necessary for the normal use that we give to them. And we have some kind of security, or we can be comfortable knowing that we won't evaluate a block with less parameters than actually necessary for, for it. So it's more, my opinion, it's not more than simply because they thought it would be more secure. But there's actually nothing that would stop us from actually having this. Is if you actually wanted to, I'm not saying go into the virtual machine and modify it to evaluate blocks partially, but you could play around a little doing a wrapper-like implementation and proxy the things that you want to redefine as the value. And it's actually really fun. You could do the same things that Facundo was showing you, but without defining blocks inside blocks inside blocks, you could define it without so many brackets. OK. So on the last part, I wanted to evaluate a little the possibilities that the blocks actually gave us. Um, that they're probably not the way that we should use it on a normal development or in, for industry standards, but we can play around a little. So first, we could use it to play around with recursive functions. Here, we are taking the advantages of having variables in Smalltalk and that our functions are not actually immutable as they are in Lambda Calculus and we can define Fibonacci calling itself from inside. On going a little step further, we can define high-order functions. So we already have things similar to high-order functions. We have methods or messages that receive blocks as parameters. For example, they inject into that we all know from collections that is actually a iterative variant of the fault error function from, from functional programming that we can define this way. It, it receives two, func two functions or whatever we want actually and then it returns us the function partially applied so we can evaluate it. This is kind of equivalent to the inject into, but the difference is it does it recursively starting from the end and evaluating until the beginning of the collection. Then we can do more crazy things as Facundo talked to you before. We can actually represent objects with blocks. We spoken before. And here we have an object factory 
that is a lock that defines what the selectors should return and how they should be evaluated. And then on the lower part, we can see the definition of what will be our object. These are not necessarily objects, it's kind of a representation of numbers, but you get the idea, you could actually use this to do more crazy things. They don't necessarily need to have parameters, you could even proxy other things. It, you could let your mind fly around. And you can see that we can even define a do not understand. Well, so, okay. Well, and some conclusions that I arrived from from this YouTube research I did about blocks are about first about functional versus object-oriented programming. There are concepts and problems that we solve that are not necessarily exclusive to one of our one paradigm. And paradigms are not as separated or exclusive one from each other as many people actually think. In fact, they're kind of cross around in a lot of places. The closures, in fact, are necessary for both because any, <coughs> any good language that wants to be fully consistent and needs to have a representation of its code as an object in, in object-oriented programming, as an expression on Lisp, or as a function on functional programming, needs to close over, close over the, the variables and bindings to assure the consistency of it. And finally, that the idea of thinking in paradigms is not, as I said, exclusive, but more as a different way of looking into the same problems that are computational problems, as it is the difference between looking computation from lambda calculus or a Turing machine. Both can do exactly the same things. They are both Turing complete, but they're different ways of looking at it. The second conclusion is the importance of understanding the tools you have at your disposal. Understanding what a tool can actually do and how it's defined at some point or even where it was originated, let us know that what are the actual abilities that this tool gives us, how can, can we exploit all of the advantages that it has, and also to understand it, it not necessarily is all that there is around. There are other possibilities and even they can be improved. So that, or we can improve it, we can play around with it, with a, we can do a lot of things. Which leads us to the last conclusion that for me is really important, that is the iterative and incremental evolution that we can see. These tools, actually, the closures that we have today in Smalltalk took more than 40 or almost 50 years to reach what we have today. They weren't, they didn't burst into existence magically. They were an idea or a, sim a simple problem that they had and they were different solutions that were coming around and getting better over time. And we got the importance of trying to keep building over what's already there and looking for new solutions for the same problem. Because even when closures are amazing, they can be even better if we keep working on them.
So, thank you for coming. You. Any questions? not actually partial application. What cool does is kind of the opposite. It's more of a secure way of evaluation a block. And what it allows is to pass more parameters than it should receive and it only gives it what's necessary. Okay. okay. Anyone else? Yes. <laughs> Yeah. It's related to the questions. Why the uh, partial application is more related to reading my mind? Like, for this, it doesn't allow partial application and it has a running function and so does JavaScript. Why are you putting that requirement that uh, we also have? Because I wasn't referring particularly to list functions, but anonymous functions as they're actually defined in Lambda calculus. And in functional programming languages like Haskell. Um, and I think that even though it's not necessary for the users that we give it, it's, it doesn't actually bring, bring any disadvantage either. So we could even have more advantages in a tool that we use every day. So that's why I think they should have the ability to be carried or be directly partial, uh, partially applied. Okay. I think this is uh, really a starting point for a much, much bigger uh, conversation. Uh, we started uh, talking about partial evaluation, uh, and I, I think uh, what uh, people were talking about, about raw on the screen, I think what is being called for is something like if I write something like this, and I send it value 1, value 2, the result we expect is 3, yes. but what we want is this to be syntactic sugar for this, right? So if we say value 1 to here, what we're going to get in any small talk today is yes. error uh, wrong number of arguments. Exactly. What I want is to get the inner block, right? I, I want to be to, to have back an anonymous function that will take in B, which is missing, and add one to it. Exactly. One um, could... So this should be syntactic sugar for this. It could right? be, or uh, we could do something like being able to send the message carry to a block. And then have the and ability to becomes, have. Uh, and then it becomes this. Uh, yes. Now, but there is nothing. Uh, but there is nothing preventing doing this not only on blocks, but on methods, but on like named methods as well, right? Because yes. they're just they, they just don't have the distinction between the home context and the actual context of the block. Exactly. But both are just compiled code. And it's what, what is fascinating and what I'm inviting anybody in, in this audience to like, join in it or maybe a separate discussion is what follows from that. Uh, from that. Because then if we, have, if we have this, the equivalence of this and this, 
Now, there are really mind-boggling possibilities now, uh, because now uh, blocks and methods, they, they become arrows, right? They, they, I, I, can, I can now have, uh, I can now do promises, right? Like if I, if I get uh, A at B, which is really just uh, uh, point, point class, you know, X, Y, uh, it doesn't say though, uh, if I send a message to this class object, well, what's going to happen, right? If objects are free to do whatever is in response to messages. Now, with partial evaluation, I can actually uh, define the method signature as a promise, as what is going to happen. And then we will be able, if, if we have that, we will be able to actually uh, reason automatically over what the code will be doing. Yes, so we will. This is a much more interesting, uh, much more interesting world than one in which code is free to do whatever it wants. Yes, and because I, I think this 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 is this, this is fascinating because the, the, to have this 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 talk on this track because we can sort of I'm inviting everybody to join maybe this discussion offline and this is. The, the, the yeah. Okay. Anyone else? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.